You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. And I'm here with Alan Levy from Alchemy Works, and we're going to talk about everything email, and we may even touch on a, some other forms of push messaging as well. But uh, email has been rumored to die every year for the last 12 years, and it's gone quite the opposite. It's suddenly become the identity for the new programmatic ecosystem and for custom audiences. So, Alan, you know, fill us in. You know, what's Alchemy Works up to? What 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 is your primary focus these days? So, um, first of all, Kevin, thank you so much for hosting. I, I really appreciate this and, and the opportunity. Um, the opportunity to defend email in a world where, you know, email is dead, long live email. Uh, we, we um, just as a, a, you know, a little history, we've been around since 2001, uh, where uh, we, we manage messaging programs for about 130 brands today um, from, you know, large enterprise brands, such as Universal Music Group and Disney to uh, small uh, or we call them emerging emerging brands. And, and most of our focus is on mid-market um, brands, about 65, 70 percent are retailers um, doing anywhere between 20 and 100 million. Um, so that being said, um, you know, we uh, have have launched. We launched about eighteen months ago our audience management um, uh, program, and um, audience management helps look at what the you know what are, what are the right users. How do we get the right cadence of messaging to to those users um, in order to uh, a on one side reactivate uh, because many many publishers and retailers are sitting with uh, two thirds of their database uh, that they qualify as inactive, whether that hasn't purchased, hasn't clicked, hasn't opened, and we get it to opens in iOS in a few minutes um, at, uh, in, in an X amount of time. Uh, and so they, they mail them either not at all or, or, or very infrequently. Um, so how do we help them you know, find value that's in their own database before they get into acquiring more customers? And then B, the second piece of audience management is how do we keep those people in the database, in the active database longer, right? Because you don't want to just activate 100 people and then, you know, 100 people fall out the bottom because they stop engaging. So um, our audience management is about, you know, messaging and cadence and understanding the data and scoring the users to identify how to, how to get them there. So that's, that's what we're primarily up to. Um, the second piece of audience management is leveraging uh, SMS and even push out to social media to, to do the same thing. Uh, and then the third piece, which we're, we're developing right now, is how do, you, um, how do you really leverage that social media properly and adjust me message cadence across all medium who are the right users to aggressively go after on Facebook or Instagram or, or elsewhere and, and pull back a little in email? Uh, who do you over-index on SMS or under-index on SMS and over-index on email and, and, and that. So that's, that's the third piece of it. So that's what we're up to. Great. Uh, well, you know, one interesting question I have is, you know, obviously in all forms of marketing, it's about getting the right message to the right audience at the right time. Um, and, you know, email, you don't have the cost of messaging, unlike paid media, uh, but you still want to make sure that you get the right message to the right audience um, at the right time. And so, you know, you, you've been, if, it's, if I remember correctly, you're building out your creative services as well. And I, I would imagine that's really about getting the creative message right, right? Because you have a missed opportunity if you mail the right audience, but with the wrong message, you not only miss the opportunity for the upside, but you potentially, you know, end up with unsubscribes. So, you know, how, how do, you, do you guys think about creative and how do you advise clients around creative? Because it can make such a difference between success and failure. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, one thing I do want to say, and this is, it, this is a misunderstanding by most marketing departments, right? That email is free or is cheap, right? It's, it's not free and it's not cheap when you overmail and you get stuck in the spam box and now you can't get out of it and now you're, you're, you're dealing with um, what to do, 
The other side of it is uh, undermailing, right? If you if you're let's let's say a fifty million dollar e-commerce business and emails only generating seven or eight million, well, that your email program should be generating at least fifteen, if not twenty million, on a fifty million dollar program, um, if, if run if run properly. And so you may have identified a whole group of people that you're not going to message to, or a cadence that's 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 softer because you think it's it's the right thing. Um, so you know we're all about testing and reiterative testing, um, and and uh, the the you know our mantra actually is that testing starts off revolutionary and becomes evolutionary. So we 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 bring the concept of of testing everything in to, to all our clients and that, and that's where um that's where we started with creative you know years ago we we just brought a we, we we started adding designers in just to do uh versioning right oh so we'll we'll do you do the your client you do the initial creative and we'll just do the versions with you change the background color change the cta move the move the move the pieces around and um as uh as we've grown we have uh, over 20 people in our, our uh, design department. We um, have uh, subject line experts. We, we've got tools for testing subject lines uh, internally. Our, our, our subject line pro tool, just to a quick um, plug, our subject line pro tool is available free uh, between now and the end of the year. So, um, message me after here, if anybody's listening and wants a free tool, uh, want free access to the tool We're we're giving it free through the end of the year. Um, but, but, you know, subject lines are a very big piece. You know, we, we, we think of creative only as visual a lot of times when we talk about email, but the written word is just as important as the, as the, the visual and, um, you know, making sure that it's both on brand and effective, and that's that's the balance that our that our team knows, um, and that's where our expertise comes into into play. Um, we we understand brands and we understand brand guidelines. Um, a, as a matter of fact, um, the the person who heads up our design team, our creative our, our creative team, came out of branding out of branding for, you know, for, for a company and, and we hired her over to manage it. So she understands, she, she came from the other side and, and made sure that the brand guidelines are adhered to. And on the other side of it though, she also understands my mantra is that sales are the most important. And, and um, just to give you, you know, a, a, a kind of wrap it all up between testing and branding. Um, we have clients who don't do discounting because their brand is so important and they, they don't allow discounting. Um, and and we've we've shown them that um, we have a case study moving the CTA up in the email uh, of an of a non promotional email increased revenue by seventeen percent. So it wasn't about buy now at half off. It was just about you know buy now or uh, see all the colors or something like that and moving it up in the email properly. Uh, and and it goes to more than that, right? Our design team also knows you you move the CTA up, but if there's a if there's a, an image in the email and somebody's looking, they should be looking at the CTA, not away from the CTA. There's there's a whole complexity of how to do uh, imagery in email and and make it work and make it sing on brand. Great, that's excellent advice. Um, one thing we notice is if one of the early things we ask uh, a, a new client when they come on board is we ask them for sort of a, a data dump of their email list so we can create custom audiences, preferably segmented into their sort of power customers, their normal customers and, and their lapsed. And it, you often they've thrown away their lapsed emails, right? And so we can't even use those for custom audiences. And it always seems like a huge missed opportunity for us because we can't even use uh, paid display media and you know paid social to reactivate them. Uh, do you find that, that that's happening a lot, that people didn't really understand the value of these sort of fallow email portions of their email list? And maybe they shouldn't have even been fallow. Maybe you have a, you know, you can resuscitate them, but, but the, you know, th this idea of sort of, I, I, I stop mailing them or I, I delete them because of lack of opens or, or lack of clicks. Uh, I sort of feel like it's a little bit draconian. Do you agree? It's, it's, um, how about, uh, 
it's stupid. <laughs> okay, uh, but let me let me let me put it that way, and I and I hope I've offended some people by saying that it's just stupid that you paid to acquire somebody on your list. If it was a if it was a customer, you probably paid somewhere between twenty and thirty five dollars to acquire them. If it was just a, a visitor, it was probably between you know fifty cents and two dollars to to get them, but they signed up. And you've decided arbitrarily to just get rid of them. Um, that's just stupid. Uh, that you know certainly don't get rid of them and 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 use them in in um, display. Use them in social. Uh, you know you should be targeting your unsubscribes in social and display. Also, that's that's very very valid. Um, and then the other piece of it is yes, there is a significant amount of value, um, and and that value of course changes. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have a case study where uh, a client was doing the same thing, just not at, not engaging their, their inactives. And um, we, you know, we took their inactive file and valued their inactive file at $2 CPM per, per mailing, ECPM, uh, a, a effective rate per thousand of, of value, just to find that, and their active file as $40 uh, ECPM, right? And so you went from two to 40 simply by engaging in an email um, because a high percentage of the active file was, was engaging. And that doesn't mean that you mail the inactive file all the time. It means you identify who in the inactive file is going to engage. There are ways of scoring them, um, but you do need to engage the active file and, and um, a combination of engaging them both in email and social and on the web is, is the best combination. And then the most important thing there is to measure. If you measure it and you take that group, um, we've found that isolating those that have recently been activated, you can perfectly measure how valuable they are because your active file may span across people who, let's say, are still active for a year and people who just recently purchased and just were active yesterday. So now take these new people and, and identify what their value is. And then you can understand, well, how much can I spend if a, if a newly activated person now is worth $60 per thousand, I, I'm willing to spend uh, significantly more than the $2 per thousand that they were generating before. Right, right, absolutely. Do you find that when you're chatting with prospects or a new client comes on board that they've sort of not been sufficiently aware of like the fact that mobile it, mo it needs to be potentially mobile first from a design perspective in their email templates and that you know while just because they're looking at their email on a desktop or a laptop doesn't mean that their customers are right i mean it, I, I find that that's the case with web development when we do it or general design so it must be the case in email as well it is um I, it has shifted i mean this was a conversation that i had on a, a fairly regular basis uh, in the past, but it, it has shifted. Um, I, I would say a lot of brands today do understand that it's mobile first because um, different than the web design piece of it, where they're, they're, they're constantly looking at the website on, on, a, on a desktop, um, because most managers are reading email on their phone today, uh, so their their boss or their CEO or somebody up further in the organization is checking their own emails on the phone. They're they're going to get that feedback pretty pretty quickly. Um, but I'm going to let that question segue us into a conversation on iOS, if you'll if you'll allow me to. Which that I was think my is, next question. So uh, is, you is, know, <laughs> is, yeah, um, I, I think it's it's really an interesting place to go if we if we look at what's going on today. Um, and, and just to update anybody who's, you know, not into it as you and I are and, and, and some of the, the people deep in the industry are and we're following it for the last eight to 10 weeks. Um, you know, Apple is releasing, um, you know, a new version of their software. And it's it, the, the objective of this new version of the software is, is protecting privacy, which I think is, is certainly very, very important. Um, in, you know, data pri privacy is one of the, the most uh, the greatest concerns consumers have today. Uh, the, 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 the other side of this conversation is what's going to happen now to a, to a metric most email marketers know and love called opens. And, and so by releasing iOS, and it's, it's not 100%, so, so 
you know, don't bank me on this, but but the conversations we've been having within the industry are that anybody who owns an, an Apple device and uses any one of the Apple native platforms to read email will therefore be rendered as an open. So if you own an, a, 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 um, an iPhone or an iPad or a, a, a MacBook, and if in any of those you use Apple Mail, um, you don't have to use it in all of those. If you use it in any of those, um, any mail sent in, regardless of whether you turn on your device or not, any mail sent in to Apple Mail, which, which is where it's going to, will automatically be opened by Apple and render as an open. So as a, a marketer, if I want to go read opens, I'm going to see, regardless of the fact that you didn't even turn on your phone, I'm going to see that you open that email, um, even if it's a Google or something else that you're, you're taking, your Yahoo email address, you're taking into the Apple uh, email um, uh, tool. So, so uh, and, and whether that's gonna affect 20 or 30 or 40% of use, doesn't really matter. It's gonna, it's gonna pollute the water enough that it's, it's going to change how we use opens and, and we can no longer use opens as a um, a proxy for engagement, right? So, because there would be people. So, so that's the bad news, right? The good news is there. We as a company have never, or I shouldn't say have never, haven't used opens as anywhere near the the top tier proxies for engagement. Recency of purchase, uh, recency of, of of click have always been the two big proxies. Frequency of purchase, and then 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 ranking those, and then later on down the road, when we get to after we filtered out night where ninety percent or eighty five percent of the revenues come from, we go to opens before we go to balance of file, right? So if they've opened ever or opened in ninety days or one hundred eighty days, etc., they may constitute, and they didn't do any of the other things such as purchase or click or anything else. We may we may put them into the to the active file. Um, we have found that um, for many clients, website visits um, works just as well. So we've we've found something, and then then we use our own scoring methodology to identify um, other proxies. So we we were, you know, as we all are with technology, we were challenged by this a few months ago, and I challenged my internal team to come up with solutions. And uh, the solutions they ended up finding increased revenue by 10% above what we were using for opens and decreased send volume by 20%. So we became actually, if you look at it, 30% more efficient because thank you, Apple, because they forced us to get away from the metric of opens and start looking at other things that, that, um, that we would determine our real true engagement and, and, and leveraging that. So um, there, if, if you look at the data um, and, and, and it also pushed us somewhere where we're taking it to balance of this year, I've challenged my, my um, data team is I want you to start to look at this differently across different types of customers. Somebody who buys lipstick um, or, or a pair of jeans or a t-shirt, which is an impulse buy uh, and, and is prone to repeat purchases is very, very different than somebody who buys a, a camper or, you know, or uh, a, you know, something of a large refrigerator, you know, and, and, and which are which are single purchases, which are consultative purchases. And, and so the, the proxy for site visits and things like that are very, very different. And, and the scoring should be very, very different for that. So um, that's the downside Then I'll, I'll quickly give you the upside. The upside is um, if, an, if a product, if, if an email is going to be rendered as an open in 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 other words, if I'm going to open up my my phone and all of my emails are there already fully downloaded, there's no lag time, I can make the emails much richer. So now you're looping me back to the design question. I challenge my design team. So what are you going to do now that you've got the ability to design much, much heavier all along? It's, you know bring down the design. We want it to be strong and powerful, but we want it to be light enough so that when, when the consumer gets to it, that, that, that fraction of a second, when they click on the email, 
and, and it opens. If it doesn't open quick enough, they're just going to hit delete. They're not even going to read the message. Well, now you can throw everything in there, including, um, vi you know, including video, and it'll be there and it'll play and it'll render. So I, I, I think, you know, this for us has been very positive and in, in, in a transformational way. Wow, that, that's really interesting. Uh, Alan, you, you talked about KPIs and that got me thinking about segmentation. One of my favorite exercises is really just think through the segmentation process for, for files, right, and, and customer files. And obviously the larger the file, the more granular you can get in your segmentation, but the, the key is to find that balance, right? You wanna do, you wanna figure out if certain customers are different so you can treat them differently, but you don't wanna get too niche to the point where it's not worth the hassle of dealing with them in a separate group. So, as your you know your teams and and are thinking about this with clients, you know, are there sort of standard best practices around segmentation that that you found to be really effective within the email list? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a, a lot of times we'll engage a, an emerging or even a mid mid sized client, and they don't separate out their buyers and their non buyers. So, you know, when, when you talk about the simplest things to do, separate out those who purchased from you and those who haven't purchased from you, right? So that's really, really segmentation. Number one, every single email should be, you know, buyers and non-buyers should be split um, in, in, in every conversation, right? Um, you, you, that gives you several things to work with, right? Um, your non-buyers, you may want to, just be much more aggressive in your discounting and promotion because you know you can encourage them to make a first purchase, right? Your first purchase, you get free shipping. Your first purchase, you get X, Y, Z. Second is levels of of you know that now we get deeper, right? Um, frequency of purchase. Uh, every brand is different to where a customer is loyal, right? Uh, uh, some brands, a loyal customer may be somebody who's purchased over X amount of dollars, two, three, four hundred dollars. Now that could be a single purchase or lifetime purchases. They may, uh, they may identify that anybody who's ever spent this much money with us becomes a loyal customer. And we have identified that his, you know, in, down the road, that those people will purchase significantly more and be very, very good true to our brand. Um, it, it may be a frequency level of purchases. Anybody who's purchased three times or four times or five times, so that, that clip also changes. Some, it may just be a second purchase, right? So to identify your VIPs, um, and, it, and it may be a combination thereof, um, layered in with recency. So it may be somebody who's purchased $300 or more, purchased at least three times with us in a lifetime and has purchased once in the last 90 days. That may be your VIP. So you, you should work to identify your VIP customers. I, I got to the most sophisticated, right? Maybe the simplest, which is buyer, non-buyer, then the most sophisticated is identifying your VIPs. Um, but your VIPs, when you do identify them, typically will generate 60 to 70% of your revenue um, and, and, and be the most loyal uh, you can possibly and, and, and probably mail them very aggressively and not see a diminishing click-through rate. You know, I would say open rate, but, but that's going to go away. A click-through rate or diminishing uh, or an increasing unsubscribe rate from them. But those are things you, you need to look at. And then there's everything in between, right? But, well, you, you, you know, it takes time to identify this VIP customer. What do I do in, in the meantime? And what do I do separately? And, and separately, it's layering on um, levels of engagement and recency of engagement onto that. So the simpler ones are the non-buyers, right? Recency of sign up. So that should be first. Separate out your 30-day signups, your 60-day signups, and then people who maybe signed up within the last year. See, maybe, maybe you don't need to have a 30 and 60. Uh, you know, maybe you can do all 60, maybe it's 90, but look at the engagement from those from those groups, from your non-buyer groups, right? And 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 then adjust your cadence accordingly. Um, people who have signed up more than a year ago and haven't engaged in a year, maybe they should only be getting your big big blowout sale of the month because that that's the only thing you should send them, and and you know that's the balance of your file. Other people maybe should be getting every single offer and every promotion because you're not sure what's going to what's going to get them. And your buyers separate out your one-time buyers, your two-time buyers, 
uh, and at least three plus until you get to, to until you get to the point of, um, of identifying your VIPs, and then layering engagement on top of those recency of of, of visit, recency of click, uh, you know, things like that. Great, great. Well, you can't really have a conversation about email with a, without talking about deliverability. It seems like at one point or another, most email marketers face a deliverability crisis or a deliverability challenge. Uh, how much of the, the industry's sort of bandwidth is spent on sort of maximizing deliverability, getting out of spam, you know, uh, spam penalties, et cetera? Or is it really based on the behavior of that marketing uh, group and they made a mistake and they deserve to be in the doghouse? I don't think anybody deserves to be in the doghouse. Uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't, I would I would be that cruel. Um, it, 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 it could have been a mistake that was made. Um, I will tell you that uh, um, we're fortunate very, very infrequently are we dealing with deliverability issues because we're so focused on engagement. And, and that's really what the ESPs look at. The, the 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 ISPs. I'm sorry. The the um, not the ISPs. The ISPs look at when determining what it is. No, you know, Google and, and Microsoft. Nobody will give you their formula for what what puts somebody into the spam box and doesn't. Um, but uh, it, you know, it used to be as simple as putting an explanation point or all capitals in your subject line, and you were, you were ban- banished. Um, it's it's not as simple. Uh, anymore as something like that. You, you can use all caps and, and explanation points and emojis in your subject line, and, and we encourage it. But um, it's um, if you engage your audience properly, you shouldn't have any problem. Uh, Google does give you their Postmaster tool for free. And, and again, very that's stupid not to uh, have it and look at it on a regular basis we you know we use we send that and um you know uh and, and other we use other third-party tools that we um we send out a, a deliverability report to every single one of our clients on a weekly basis to show them what what their deliverability performance is and and so we're we're making sure to look at it as well um but but um if you do run into a, a, a problem, remediation is important. Pull back on the list. That don't don't pull back on your entire list. Identify which which ISP it is. If it's Gmail, then pull back on your Gmail send. So you don't have to pull back on your AOL or Microsoft sends just because you're getting into you're getting blocked by Gmail. Segregate your mailings. Then you segregate your mailings by ISP or at least the ISP that's giving you a challenge pull in the only the most engaged of that group, slowly market to, to that group and watch it carefully. And, you know, as your Google Postmaster ranking goes up and your inbox placement goes up, you're, 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 you're clear to, to, to do more. Um, but, you know, it, looping it back to the very first part of this conversation, um, you know, being defensive and not mailing 70% of your file because they've been inactive, um, just because you're afraid of getting caught in in spam uh, is stupid, right? And and mailing them all the time without looking at engagement is also stupid. You need the right balance, the right understanding, the right segmentation to understand how to engage them, to engage them properly, and to get the most out of them, right? So if you should be if you should have a $15 million email program and you have a seven and you're pr- trying to defend that seven, well, you're leaving $8 million of revenue on the table just because you're being careful. That's foolish, right? You know, so, so find the right balance. Great. Uh, f- final question is, is back to sort of creative uh, within a lot of the ad channels at the moment, uh, dynamic creative is, is becoming increasing, increasingly popular. And of course, uh, on websites, you know, personalization, hyper-personalization is be, becoming increasingly popular <clears throat> because you want to give the, uh, the customer the, the, the proper experience. Um, you know, not every ESP and not every email program allows for that level of customization and you're sort of forced to work, work within segments. Do you feel like the future of the ESPs is that it will be far more customization of, of messaging and creative? Or do you feel like there's still a lot to be said for, you know, just using segments and and different creative messages against those segments. Yes, 
Um, <laughs> so why did I answer yes? Um, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a, a blue shirt today, right? So does that mean that I only buy blue shirts? Do you know anything about me by, by virtue of the fact that I'm wearing a blue shirt, but the, the, or, or the fact that it's a polo shirt, right? Can you, can you determine that because I bought a blue polo shirt that I'm going to buy another blue polo shirt? Um, or that I'm not going to buy another blue polo shirt, or I'm going to buy a pair of a t-shirt or a pair of jeans or, you know, or anything else. It's very, very hard, um, especially in today's consumer world, no matter how much personalization you want to use to really identify what somebody is or isn't going to do next perfectly. Um, so therefore, there should be a fair amount of, of, of personalization in a program. Um, we, and again, this varies by consumer product, the product, the consumer type, and, and et cetera. So there should be a fair amount of personalization within a program, um, but there also should be a fair amount of um, trial and error and testing. And, and, you know, because, because as human beings, you know, we like to explore, we like to try new things. And so while, you know, I may go to the same restaurant, you know, once or twice a month, you know, because I'm comfortable there, it's an easy place to go to. It doesn't mean that I won't try a new restaurant and, and, and give it a shot. And so if that, if you were to personalize my world, Right, that new restaurant would say, "Oh, I can't market to him. He's very loyal to to X Y Z, and he always goes there. I'll never get to him. Why waste my dollars on uh, on him?" Versus saying, "Hey, try us out, and, and you don't don't even tell me you just like so and so because if you just like so and so, I might as well go to so and so. It's tried and true, right?" So there there's there's a good balance, and that's why I say yes. Right, you you need to give human beings the opportunity to explore. Correct. Don't show me women's dresses and scarves and, and, and shoes over and over and over again. But do every once in a while, let me know that the brand also has women's products, because I may forward that email to my wife, I may buy it for, for somebody, I may buy something for her, etc. So there's a fair amount of personalization that's necessary. But there's also um, a, 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 the ability to give people the chance to explore and to use you know, good old, old marketing skills. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, those are great final words. Thanks so much for joining me, Alan. And uh, people can find you on LinkedIn or on Alchemy Works, I'm sure. Absolutely. Al AlchemyWorks.com, W-O-R-X. And uh, try out Subject Line Pro, please. It's free till the end of the year. Shoot me an email if you need to get in. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe, or follow.